The following is a catalog of events that occurred over the course of two weeks in the year 2011. These strange and unnerving happenings took place in Greene County, Illinois, a rural, sparsely populated area located on the southwestern part of the state. The incidents have yet to be explained. Many theories have circulated as to what may have ensued, but at the time of this writing, nothing has been corroborated. The events in question are presented in chronological order. Feel free to draw your own conclusions. Monday, February 28th, 2 10 p.m. The accident is the biggest anyone in the area has seen in 27 years. A school bus full of Greenfield Elementary third graders, on its way back from a field trip to a local farm, collides with a dump truck and loses control. After impact, its wheels skid off the road. That's when momentum takes over, causing it to roll three times before coming to a stop upside down in an irrigation ditch. Six children and one teacher are killed. Fourteen others are injured. When police arrive on the scene, alcohol is detected on the breath of the dump truck driver, Ray Peck. He is arrested on site and booked at the local jail in Carlton, Illinois. Wednesday, March 2nd. The only hotel in Carlton, the Cat's Inn, is booked to capacity. Family and friends begin arriving into town to attend funerals and memorial services. A brown van is spotted in the parking lot of the inn. Thursday, March 3rd, 10 a.m. The funeral of Lily North, one of the girls who died in the accident, occurs on this morning. Lily's mother, Candace, does not attend. Her husband, Jared, tells those who ask that she's taken Lily's death very hard. Thursday, March 3rd, 2 p.m. A funeral for David Frost. Another casualty of the accident happens. It is a small service. Only intimate friends of the family are invited. Alan Spencer, David's schoolmate and closest friend, is said to look the worst for wear at the event, even more so than the Frost family. Spencer was in the bus during the accident, and even though he was sitting next to David, he managed to escape with only a few bumps and scratches. However, the tragedy has taken a psychological toll on the young boy. He has complained of nightmares as of late, in these dreams, he mentions seeing his friend David, head dangling from a loose, broken neck, walking into his bedroom and whispering horrible things to him in the night. His parents have begun discussing taking him to a child psychologist in order to help him cope with his guilt and grief surrounding this accident. Thursday, March 3rd, 4 p.m. Mourners set up a roadside memorial at the spot where the accident occurred as a way to commemorate those who had tragically lost their lives. About seven people visit the site between 4 and 7 p.m. The mourners park their cars along the side of the road. A brown van is seen amongst them. There are songs and prayers, flowers, teddy bears, and handwritten letters are placed at the spot of the accident. Candles are lit. It is said to be a beautiful memorial. Friday, March 4th, 11 a.m. John Mayhew, the teacher who was killed in the accident, is cremated. There is no service. Lisa Mayhew, John's wife, takes the urn containing her husband's ashes back home with her. Friday, March 4th, 6 p.m. The first death is reported that evening when Jared North returns home from the grocery store to find his wife, Candace, dead. The top half of her skull removed with near surgical precision, her scalp is nowhere to be found. In her hand, she is clenching her daughter's brush. Police find no sign of forced entry, and hardly any evidence of a scuffle. A full investigation into the death of Candace North is launched. On the brush, Jared would later tell the papers. She was holding Lily's brush. It meant a lot to her. Every night, she would brush Lily's hair before bed. I used to joke that Candace treated her like one of those American girl dolls, you know. Now they're both gone. Saturday, March 5th, 3 p.m. A memorial service is held on the football field of North Green High School and is attended by over 700 people, including friends and family of the deceased who had come in from out of town. News of Candace North's murder begins to spread throughout the event. 
Sunday, March 6th, 10, 10 a.m. Alan Spencer's parents bring him to church, but rather than forcing him to attend the service where the accident would be discussed, they let him use the playground at the park next door. He is last seen climbing a tree at 10.30 a.m. when Janet Finch cuts through the parking lot on her way to the church. Fifteen minutes later, the congregation hears the scream of Margaret Peters, who had been walking her dog down the sidewalk. The churchgoers empty into the street and find Alan lying on the ground, his head twisted a full 180 degrees. At the time, it is believed Alan had fallen from the tree and landed face first onto the asphalt, snapping his neck. Investigators on the scene found the note in his back pocket. It reads, If you yourself cannot release, then it will come to take a piece. Alan Spencer's parents later confirmed that the note is not written in his handwriting. Sunday, March 6th, 3.34 p.m. Examiners discovered that aside from a broken neck, Alan Spencer's corpse is missing four incisors and two molars from his mouth, none of which were recovered. Strangely enough, his injuries mirror those of his good friend David Frost, right down to the missing teeth. Monday, March 7th, 11.19 p.m. Cartoonist Dan Kolb's Chevy Tahoe is found on the side of the road after running headfirst into a telephone pole. When paramedics arrive, they discover him unconscious in the driver's seat, but breathing. Kolb doesn't have any relation to anyone who died in the bus accident on the 28th, but his wife passed on from breast cancer two years prior. The widower who lives alone in Carlton has attended therapy twice a week since the death of his wife, and those close to him later claim that he never took off his wedding band. His injuries include a separated shoulder, a head contusion, and a missing finger. Specifically, the ring finger of his left hand. His wedding band is also missing. He is taken to St. Mary's General and treated for his injuries. Tuesday. March 8th, 2.45 a.m. Neighbors report screaming coming from the house of Lisa Mayhew. Police arrive to the home to find Mayhew in shock. Her speech is erratic and incoherent. She is trembling uncontrollably, and she has an injury. Deep cuts on her left arm that appear to have been left by an animal. Mayhew is given a sedative and treated, but she does not answer any questions when asked about where her injuries came from. Police notice the urn that once contained her husband's ashes in the bathroom. It is empty and it appears by the look of things that she flushed them down the toilet. Police find no evidence of forced entry into her home, but don't estimate the possibility of a break-in due to her bizarre babblings. Some of the things she is quoted in saying are outlined in the police report. I had to forget him, or it would have killed me. His mouth was so wide. So many teeth. His face face like like patches of skin. John's gone now. Lisa is taken to St. Mary's, where she's treated for her injuries and kept under surveillance. The police call her sister Ava, who lives in Chicago, and inform her of the situation. She agrees to catch a flight down the following day. Tuesday, March 8th, 3.35 p.m., Dan Kolb awakes in the hospital. He is lucid, but unresponsive to questions. In fact, he refuses to speak at all. Doctors decide to keep him for an extra day to monitor him for brain trauma before releasing him. A nurse, Margot Johnson, gives him a pencil and a pad of paper, in case he might want to write down his thoughts since he doesn't wish to talk. Wednesday, March 9th, 8.55 p.m. Police find Ray Peck dead in his cell. He's been horribly maimed. There was a hole in his side the size of a softball. It is later discovered that his liver was removed and taken by whoever had committed the heinous murder. On the wall, written in Peck's own blood, is the phrase, If you yourself cannot release, then it will come to take a piece. Police have no leads on who snuck into Peck's cell and murdered him. The security footage is of little use, 
The camera pointed at his cell cuts to black roughly between the times of 8.40 and 8.43 p.m. It is believed that the murder occurred during these three minutes, but the speed in which it must have happened is astounding. None of the other security cameras at the jail show anything out of the ordinary. Given the note found in his back pocket, with a phrase matching the one written on the wall of Peck's cell, a murder investigation is now opened up into Alan Spencer's death. Thursday, March 10th, 10.05 a.m. Nurse Margaret Johnson enters Dan Kolb's hospital room to find that he is missing. It appears at some point during the morning, he changed into his clothes and exited the hospital without anyone noticing. She finds the notebook that she gave him had been left behind. Johnson would later tell reporters, There were these weird pictures that he had drawn in it. The man or thing, I, I don't know. It wore a suit, but it had like a big wide smile and these sharp teeth. The drawings were really good, but they gave me the creeps. And that smile was all there was to its face. The rest of the thing's face was non-existent. He must have drawn it over a dozen times. There were also pictures of a pocket watch with a kind of eye on it. And to tell you the truth, for some reason I can't explain. That bothered me more than the man thing. The only words that Kolb had managed to write was the familiar phrase. If you yourself cannot release then it will come to take a piece. Kolb will not be seen again for three months. It is not known what he was doing during this time. Margaret reported Kolb's disappearance to the hospital staff and left the notebook on the counter. He would sit there for four hours until it was picked up by Lisa Mayhew, while she was being checked out of St. Mary's by her sister Ava. When Lisa saw the illustrations Kolb had drawn, they triggered a panic attack. She screamed and began to throw a fit in the hospital lobby, only calming down after being given a sedative. Lisa would travel to Chicago with her sister later that evening, and would never set foot in Greene County again. Over the next four months, she would sell her home, then go back to her maiden name, Fitzroy. To this day, she has refused to answer any emails or calls regarding her husband, the accident, her injuries, or what happened the night the police were called to her home. Friday, March 11th, 4 p.m. Police issue a statement that they believe Donaldson was responsible for the deaths of at least three people, Candace North, Alan Spencer, and Ray Peck. But that investigation is ongoing until they deduce how the murders were committed. The cryptic phrase found on the Donaldson hotel room is the piece of evidence that makes Donaldson the prime suspect. Saturday, March 12th, 6 a.m. The Greene County Gazette publishes the sheriff's statement regarding Donaldson. Papers are distributed countrywide. Saturday, March 12th, 2 p.m. Police are called to the spot where the February 28th school bus accident occurred by Belle Parker, a teacher at the Greenfield Elementary. She shows them something strange that she's discovered at the memorial. A ring of candles that have been set up on the side of the road. A note that had been slipped under one of the candles. She had found it while paying her respects to the deceased, then dialed 911 when she recognized that it had the same thing that had been reported in the papers. If you yourself cannot release, then it will come to take a piece. Saturday, March 12th, 3.30 p.m. Margaret Johnson delivers the pad of paper with Don Kolb's drawing to the sheriff's station, pointing out that he had written dozens of times the same cryptic message that had appeared at the other crime scenes. Kolb becomes a person of interest, and when it is discovered that he has seemingly left town, an APB is put out for his arrest. Sunday, June 12th, 10 p.m. Dan Kolb is killed on Interstate 65 in Huntsville, Alabama when he stepped out in the road in front of a speeding semi-truck. The driver told police that he didn't see him until it was too late. He would say to reporters, Only thing I saw was a big wide smile. And a second later, I heard the thud and I knew that I hit him. His face wasn't right. His eyes were massive. I know I only saw him for a second, but I swear I could tell something weren't right in him. Like there was, like there was some kind of sickness or pain behind him, and he, and he was happy. Happy it was all about to end. 
in the glove compartment of Kolb's car. Police found a notebook with dozens of illustrations of the same creature that he had drawn in the hospital room. On nearly every page, the art was accompanied by the same cryptic phrase that haunted Greene County investigators. If you yourself cannot release, then it will come to take a piece. Watch new scary bits every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. 